Thank you, Meredith. Um, so this is joint work with Vasco Carvalho and John Spray, who are both also at Cambridge. And I'm going to talk today about how some tools we developed in a different project can be repurposed to think about which firms are critical for meeting governmental production goals in the context of the current crisis. The basic idea is to provide a method by which we can take data on firm to firm transactions in an economy, represented here by the network on the left, and reorganize it to find the supply network that connects all the firms in the economy, represented here by the network on the right, and then use this supply network to identify critical firms. Those firms without whom it would not be possible to meet a given production objective that the government might have. In the network on the right, we're representing those firms by the large black dots, whereas the small black dots you may or may not be able to see uh, are those firms that are not critical. Our starting point is a view of production that's based on work by two economists and winners of the Nobel Prize, Vasily Leontiev and Tajilin Koopmans. The basic idea is to think about technologies as recipes. For example, the technology for producing a car requires combining different inputs or ingredients in the right proportions or ratios. You need four wheels, one steering wheel, one engine and so on to produce a car. In this diagram, we take a simple hypothetical economy that produces five intermediate goods a through E, and two final goods, good F and good G. An arrow that goes from here, raw material one to input B, represents that you need raw material one to produce input B. And the two label next to the arrow represents that you need two units of raw material one in order to produce one unit of input B. So in order to produce input D, we need to combine three units of input A with two units of input B, and so on. On top of this representation of production technologies, we can add firms to get a supply network. So in this case, in this example, we see that there are two producers of good A, two producers of good B, two producers of good C, one of good D, three of good E, and so on. An arrow now represents which firms are able to supply which other firms. So an arrow that originates at firm B2 and travels down to firm E1 represents that firm B2 is able to supply firm E1. Notice that not every producer of a given good is able to supply all the firms that might like that good as an input. So for example, here, firm B1 is not able to supply firm E1 with the B good, and firm E2 has to rely on the supply of B2. Why might this be the case? Well, there are many reasons why some firms can't or may not be able to transact with other firms in practice. It might be that the B good here is a bulky good that incurs very large transportation costs for being transported over large distances. And here, maybe B2 is located adjacent to E1, whereas B1 is located at the other end of the country. And there are many other reasons you might think of too. There's a large literature in economics and sociology showing that supply relationships are generally important um, for enabling two firms to supply each other effectively. Whatever the reasons, if you end up with a networked economy like this, a supply network like this, where not everyone can supply everyone else, the structure of the network is going to matter. To see that, let's suppose the government has a production goal in which it has to produce some of the F good and some of the G good. If you want to add some context, we might think about the F good as being face masks and the G good as being hand sanitizer. And then we can ask ourselves the question, which of these firms are critical for meeting that production objective? Let's start with firm D1. If we take firm D1, then it's the only producer of the D good. There's no other firm that produces the D good. And so if for one reason or another, it's unable to produce, then both firms F1 and F2 aren't going to be able to source the D input they require. And so they're not going to be able to produce either. 
and the government's not going to get any of the F good and it's not going to meet its production goals. So in this case, firm D1 is a critical firm. Now let's consider firm B2 instead. There are two producers of the B good, B1 and B2, but B2 is the only firm able to supply E1, E2 or E3, all the producers of the E good. So without B2, none of the E producers are able to source the B good that they need for production. That means that if for one reason or another B2 is unable to produce, then firms E1, E2 and E3 won't be able to produce either. And then there'll be no production of the E good, but the E good is an input that we need in order to produce the G good. So the G good producers aren't going to be able to produce either. And again, the government's production objectives aren't going to be met. So in this case, B2 is also a critical good. Critical good. Last, let's consider the case of C1. Here things are a bit more subtle. If we look at C1 and we imagine that it can't produce, then that's going to be a problem for both E1 and E2. Both of those firms rely on C1 to supply it with the C good. And if C1 can't produce, they're not going to be able to produce either. However, E3 can still produce. E3 could source its C good from C2 instead of C1. So the question about whether the economy is going to be able to meet its productive production objectives or not comes down to one of whether E3 can scale up its production to replace the missing production from firms E1 and E2. In order to do that, a necessary condition is that firm C2 is able to scale up its production as well, because in order for E3 to be able to produce, it's going to have to source more of the C good. So we can see from this example that we need more information than just who can supply who. We also need to know what the capacities are of the, of the different firms in the economy. That's fine. If we have those capacities, then we can do the same kind of exercise that we're talking about here for all of the different firms. But what would be nice is if we had a systematic method for being able to do this. So I'm going to tell you how we can do that. OK, we can take the basic intuitions from the hypothetical example we've seen and provide a general method for finding critical firms by thinking about the economy as a system of pipes with the goods flowing through them, like water flows through pipes. The transformation required to do this isn't trivial, and I'm not going to get into the details about how we do it here. But once we've done it, the problem of whether we can meet some production objectives becomes the problem of whether the flow through the pipes of the water is sufficiently large. Are we getting enough flow from the taps down to the lake at the bottom? We can then also ask which firms are critical for achieving this. And the way we can do that now is we can just imagine there being a blockage in the pipe at one of the junctions. So if we take a junction which corresponds to the position of one of the firms in the supply network and we imagine it's blocked, we can ask the question, what is the flow rate through this system of pipes? Is it large enough to meet the government's objectives or not? And if it is, then that firm isn't critical. We don't need it in order to be able to produce enough of the goods. On the other hand, if the flow diminishes um, such that the objectives can't be reached, that firm is critical. Now, what's nice about doing this is that we've transformed the problem into one of calculating maximum flows. And that's a well-studied problem in operations research. Moreover, in terms of the mathematics, it's just a linear programming problem. And we are able to solve those kind of problems very well. Our approach has a lot of flexibility in how it's applied. We can apply a production goal for the government related to a couple of specific products, as we hypothesized in our initial example, or equally, we could take a much general goal of trying to achieve a certain output capacity for the entire economy. We can also consider bespoke counterfactuals. What happens if a given town has to be shut down because of an outbreak of the virus? What happens if a group of firms that are in financial distress simultaneously fail, and so on. More generally, our approach provides a framework for thinking about where, the gov where government should target its resources in ensuring productive capacity in the economy. Which firms should be bailed out if many are in distress? 
which industries should we relax restrictions from to enable workers to, to work in closer proximity, and so on. So far, we've talked about what's possible in principle. Practically, there are several challenges to overcome, but also solutions to these challenges. First, supply networks only have the approximate structure that we need. To give them the right structure, we need to, to prune them, and we want to prune them in the minimal way possible. Now, computationally, that's a hard problem, but there are good algorithms that can generate approximate solutions. And we can check that these algorithms work well. So in the case of Uganda, uh, we only need to ignore about 4% or a little less than 4% of the value of transactions in order to get the network into the right structure that we need. And the number is similar for Belgium. If we have data on which inputs are being supplied by which firms, then that's great. That helps us a lot, but that data might not be available. We might not know exactly what good is being sold by which firm to which other firm. In that case, it's really important that we infer when two firms are supplying a substitutable input, the same input. In order to do that, we can use hierarchical clustering algorithms that again, seem to work fairly well in practice. Another piece of data that we, that we need and may not have is the capacities of different firms. We can get a crude approximation of this though by just looking at the output of different firms over time. The final thing to mention is that if we want to run lots of different counterfactuals, we want to think systematically about whether each firm is critical to a given objective or not, we have to run our or we'll have to calculate these maximum flows many, many times. But because calculating the maximum flow is just a linear programming problem, and we have good, efficient algorithms for doing that, the whole problem is scalable. And so we can do this at an economy-wide level. To see the scalability, let me show you um, an example of Uganda. So on the left-hand side, let me, and this is the picture that you saw at the beginning, let me tell you a little bit of more in detail now what's going on. So on the left-hand side, we have all the different firms in the Ugandan economy represented by different nodes or orange dots. And then a link between firms here represents that those two firms um, transacted a non-trivial amount with each other at some point during the time period 2010 to 2015. So this gives us an idea of which firms are supplying which other firms. Okay, and this is aggregated over all those time periods, but we have the data that tells us specifically when these transactions are occurring as well. With the data on firm-to-firm -firm transactions, we can then construct our supply network using the techniques that we've talked about, and then transform the supply network into a flow problem like we talked about. Once we've done that, we can consider whether each firm in the Ugandan economy is critical for meeting some production objective. In this case, we set the production objective as being that the, the, the productive capacity of the Ugandan economy had to be sufficient to meet the overall demand in the economy. Those firms that are represented by big black dots in the picture on the right are those firms without whom it wouldn't be possible for supply to meet demand. We're working here with the Ugandan data because the Ugandan government has collected the necessary firm-to-firm -firm transactions for taxation purposes and made it available to us. Similar data exists for some other countries, but not all. And in the, the case of the UK, the UK government has started collecting this data um, since the crisis. Okay, thank you.